as the time finally arrived after six months of grueling combat after the loss of Avdivka with Chas of Yar now being a frontline city and I was there last trip I filmed there as we were trying to evacuate civilians from there now seeing that moved to a frontline city now seeing the Ukrainians facing a 10 to 1 artillery disadvantage a 30 to 1 disadvantage when it comes to air power according to the Ukrainian government and if that and I'm gonna be honest I believe the 10 to 1 numbers maybe it's 8 to 1 maybe it's 9 to 1 but when you're on the front at different points it certainly feels like 10 to 1 as the Ukrainians run dangerously low not on just artillery but also on air defense as their electrical uh, infrastructure is targeted with power plants outside of Kiev blown up with power plants and hydroelectric plants blown up as Ukrainian civilian infrastructure is targeted this is a situation where the Ukrainians are pretty being put more and more in the back foot and a large part of the reason why the Russians have been able to advance is there have been some innovations when it comes to their drone technology there have also been some innovations when it comes to command and some reforms but it is in large part due to the restriction of ammunition and the dis uh and, and the uh, the, the difference in just the and the firepower that the russians can bring to their side at every point in this war artillery has been a major deciding factor for who wins battles if you can bring more power more force more firepower to bear on a position you are going to be much more likely to take it and so while the russians haven't been able to break through the front and let me just say it is impressive in and of itself that with a 10 to 1 artillery disadvantage and a 30 to 1 air power disadvantage with the Russians relying more and more on dumb glide bombs to bomb Ukrainian positions with the air force and the air power being brought down upon the Ukrainians more and more and more that they've been able to hold the line and that they've been able to largely keep the Russians from breaking through or making any breakthroughs and they've only been able to crawl forward that in and of itself is impressive but that is not sustainable and so they've needed supplies and for the last six months we've had the back and the forth and the back and the forth with kevin mccarthy getting ousted causing chaos over ukraine aid because there was a 24 billion dollar proposal when kevin mccarthy was still house speaker and then that was kicked down the road and then the speakership race happened and then Mike Johnson, after going through Tom Emmer, Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, all these other P options, eventually Mike Johnson was chosen, who had a terrible, and I will say just terrible voting record on Ukraine aid, but he said, hey, I will not abandon Ukraine. I am now House Speaker. I represent the United States of America. I must look out for its interests, and I will not abandon Ukraine. And then for the six months, he proceeded to abandon Ukraine with every single proposal getting shot down due to, in large part, a small fringe on the edge of the party, Marjorie Taylor Greene and others, Matt Gates, uh, saying to him, we don't want any Ukraine to pass, no Ukraine aid to pass. And so instead of just having a vote on Ukraine aid and having it be decided, because this is how voting used to work, it used to work like this. Hey, I don't support legislation, so I'm gonna vote against it. Oh, well, I support legislation, so I'll vote for it. And then the bill passed because it had majority support. Where now, since the majority was so small for the Republicans, now it's just a one seat effective majority, literally a one seat voting majority. The conversation was this, because it only took one person to call a recall vote. I don't want Ukraine aid. The majority of Congress can support Ukraine aid. Doesn't matter, because I'm not even gonna allow a vote because I'm gonna tell Mike Johnson, no vote or recall. And for six months, that's been the equation. But there was an exception. And the exception was, if you give us compromise on the border, then we can give Ukraine aid. Now, it was already a bad idea, tying a completely separate issue to this national security priority. Now, you could say that the border is also an important issue, but the border is also a very divisive issue. Republicans and Democrats disagree on dreamers. Republicans and Democrats disagree on visa requirements. Republicans and Democrats disagree on how the asylum system should work. Republicans and Democrats disagree on when it comes to what proper solutions to these issues. There's, there's a disagreement.
There's fervent disagreement. Part of the reason that Democrats didn't like Donald Trump was because of his positions on immigration. And so Donald Trump lost, Joe Biden won, he had a different position, and trying to tie these two issues together when one is incredibly divisive and the other was largely bipartisan, it's still technically bipartisan now, but was even more bipartisan at the time, it was a dangerous game. It was leveraging a national security priority, leveraging American allies' defense, and leveraging a war that could determine the future of Europe for a immigration victory on an unrelated issue. Imagine if we went to the Republicans and said, if you want to pass something on fentanyl to deal with fentanyl, by the way, at one point, fentanyl payments for testing fentanyl crossing the border, trying to stop it, was even added to the Ukraine aid as a sweetener. It didn't push it forward, though. Uh, in order to deal with the fentanyl crisis, uh, we need to pass the no say gay law, no the don't say gay law nationally. In order to deal with the fentanyl crisis, then we need to have uh, in every state in the union legalized marijuana. It doesn't make any sense tying these two issues together. It also makes it less likely that the Ukraine aid would pass. But we had Chris Murphy and James, I think it was James Langford, it was Langford, Senator Langford, that sat down, Republican and Democrat, Langford being a an extremely conservative, anti, generally anti-immigration Republican from Oklahoma, comes forward, negotiates a deal, and after five months, they finally sit the deal down and they said, look, we have a deal, we negotiated. And the Senate seemed happy generally, the House generally was okay with it, it looked like it was gonna get a vote, and then Donald Trump stood up and said, no immigration victory to the Democrats, and since it was not a complete immigration win for the Republicans, since Democrats controlled the Senate and the presidency, and they wanted some compromises on their side too, even though they didn't get enough compromises, in my opinion, there should have been stuff on the Dreamers in there if we're gonna try to be making some comprehensive immigration reform, and this is a demand that Democrats have been asking for forever, especially since Donald Trump's trying to target birthright citizenship in a second term. But Donald Trump said no, and so all that negotiation went in the toilet. And then Mike Johnson was in a difficult position of saying he wouldn't abandon Ukraine, but then saying that you needed immigration reform in order to pass Ukraine aid. And now he can't pass immigration reform because Trump doesn't want it, but he also needs to pass Ukraine aid. He boxed himself into a corner, and he was stuck in that corner for months without, able, without being able to find a way out. And so the Senate passed its own bill that was a combination of Israel, Taiwanese, and Ukraine aid for $95 billion, and they sent it down to the House. They even added a sweetener when it comes to fentanyl and testing for fentanyl when it crosses the border to try to stem the fentanyl crisis coming from the South. And it was held up. And Mike Johnson held it up, and he wouldn't hold a vote on it. And again, the question essentially was not, will Mike Johnson support it? The question was not, will the majority of Republicans support it? These were never the question. The question was, will there be a vote on it? Because it already had majority support in the Senate, majority report support in the House, and it had support for the presidency. But he would not hold a vote on it. And so the discharge petition started up which would mean that they could go around Mike Johnson. And that started to add some heat because that would be a massive loss for Mike Johnson and it would be extremely embarrassing and make people question his leadership when there's already a lot of questions coming around about Mike Johnson's leadership as a non-veteran legislator being given the speakership in large part just because not a pe enough people in the Republican Party hated him enough to reject him. So he put himself in quite the pickle. But then... He listened to Trump. Trump said, how about we make some of it alone? So he wanted to add some new stuff. There was some conversations about the TikTok bill. And after some jostling, we got this announcement a few days ago. And when I say a few, I do mean two days ago from Mike Johnson saying that he is going to bring forward three separate bills for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan to the floor for people to vote on. And we're going to listen a little bit to Mike Johnson, and then we're going to talk about how this delay added basically nothing to the bill. It is essentially the same thing from six months ago, just with a slightly different refinancing plan. And that's really it. So let's listen. 
just had a policy conference with all the House Republicans. Um, we laid out the plan on how to finally address the uh, supplemental uh, situation. Um, there are precipitating events around the globe that we're all watching very carefully, and we know that the world is watching us to see how we react. Um, we have uh, terrorists. By the way, can I just say, if Ukraine aid is passed this weekend, damage has already been done. And this is going to be the tough conversation I have to have. Damage has already been done. The Russians, by watching us wait for six months, and it's not just the Russians, but other countries as well, uh, can probably come to the conclusion that if they want to delay American action or if they want to block American action, our most vulnerable point would simply be propagandizing our own legislators. Because there are at least nine Republicans in the House, and that's being very charitable, that are just in a straight-up pro-Russia caucus. And the reason I say the number nine and I could go into individual statements from Marjorie Taylor Greene saying the Ukrainians are sacrificing babies to gather their organs to fund the war effort, which is a real thing she said on national television. Or I could point to the fact that she said that the Russians are defending Christianity in Ukraine, even though the Russians have been prosecuting evangelicals, have destroyed, I think it was 400 Baptist churches. That's according to the chief rabbi who responded to her and criticized her. Um, and has gone over Protestants in occupied communities, putting bases, army bases on their former churches. Uh, I could go through the specific statements, but nine voted against a resolution to condemn the kidnapping of Ukrainian children. When people make the argument about genocide in Ukraine, this is the key point, is that Ukrainian children are being kidnapped, sent to Russian patriotic schools, told you're not Ukrainian, Ukraine is fake, you're Russian, you're Russian, speak Russian, sing the Russian national anthem, wear the Russian uniform. You're taking the children and trying to erase their culture from them, stealing them from their parents, and against international law, deporting them to Russia. And they couldn't even gather the strength to condemn that because they're too busy polishing Putin's boots, at least definitely in Marjorie Taylor Greene's case. And these were the people that were dictating Republican policy for the last six months because their policy was Republican policy for the last six months, whether they want to like it or not. They could say they support Ukraine, but if they've blocked Ukraine aid for six months, for six months, they were doing what Marjorie Taylor Greene wanted, which was not send anything for the Ukrainians, for the Ukrainians as the situation got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And tyrants and terrible leaders. Are and the damage has already been done. They, if they can continue to funnel propaganda into the minds of legislators, either through social media or through direct conversations, I know that I think the Chinese government recently called for, recently had a meeting with some legislators over TikTok. I mean, it's not a direct comparison, but like you can see, like other governments are looking at Congress as, as something that they can definitely interact with and try to twist to their own intentions. And if they can do that through misinformation or through propaganda, and they can at least slow down the process, that can have a, uh, a, a demonstrative impact on American foreign policy, as we've seen it had for the last six months, delaying America's response. And I mean, it, and if we pass it this weekend, we will have only had our response delayed, even though we're, we're, we are tweaking the Ukraine aid slightly, but people see a weakness. People see a weakness of the American system. Mike Johnson and his party has revealed a, a weakness of the democratic system. And so this is something that is going to have at least that impact for a while. That, that image of America just kind of, kind of sitting on their hands for six months as the situation got worse is going to be on the minds of countries like South Korea, who could possibly face an aggressive state but is reliant on the United States for its own defense. Would the United States come to South Korea's defense, or would we wait six months and talk about it as Seoul is wiped off the face of the earth by North Korean artillery? Like, so th this is this is something that's already going to have a long-term demonstrative impact. Hopefully, over time, that impact can be whitt whittled down and we can restore credibility. But this is already going to have a negative impact around the world, like Putin and Xi and. Uh, and in Iran, and they're watching to see if America will stand up for its allies and in our own interest around the globe, and we will. Uh, what I presented to the conference tonight is, is our uh, play call on this. What we'll do is, is bring to the House floor independent measures. We won't be voting on the Senate supplemental in its current form, but we will vote on each of these measures separately in four different pieces. We will vote. So Personally, I'm fine with it being voted on separately if they actually have the vote. If he does, if, if he's like, okay, we're going to vote on the Israel aid. Oh, I dropped the Ukraine. I don't know where it went. Obviously, that would be horribly slimy, horribly disgusting. But I don't think he's going to do that. 
Uh, I'm fine with it being voted on separately because I think legislators should have an opportunity to either support Israel aid and Ukraine aid, or just Ukraine aid and not Israel aid. Or, for example, support Ukraine aid, support Taiwan aid, and not support Israel aid, which people could have a reason to do. So I do like that as an idea. I do like it. But did it really ne take need six months to figure that out when that was talked about since the beginning? In fact, if we would have voted on Ukraine aid back in during when Kevin McCarthy was still speaker, we would have voted on it individually. So it took us six months to return to square one. Is that what it took? The only difference is the size because we've waited too long. Vote on the Israel aid, uh, on the uh, aid to Ukraine, on the aid to the Indo-Pacific, and then another measure that has our national security priorities uh, included. And that has some of the things with regard to the uh, loan lease uh, option and the, uh, the Repo Act and, and some other sanctions on Iran and, and other measures that we've been talking about here for quite some time. We'll also allow for an amendment process on the floor so that the, uh, the regular processes and orders of the House can play out. Every member ultimately will be able to uh, vote their own conscience on all of these matters and everyone will have an opportunity to weigh in and bring the amendments that they uh, think are, are suitable. Uh, we'll follow the germaneness rules of the House, of course, and the regular rules with regard to amendments. Uh, but I think the, the final product uh, will be something that uh, everybody can uh, take confidence in because they got to um, they got to vote their district and, and vote uh, their conscience. Um, you just members OK, you get the general idea here. Now, when this was announced and we are going to talk about some of the specifics of the bill in a little bit, because it's basically it's basically the same with a few things tweaked. This all could have, been, again, been settled six months ago. So all we did was sit on our hands for six months so Mike Johnson could stay politically safe because the Republicans were going through a crisis where some of their members don't, I, I, I don't think, honestly, could point on a map and even identify the countries in Eastern Europe that they're making decisions about, very strong, passionate decisions about. Uh, but moving on, uh, two Republicans are now gathered together in the ousting effort. Marjorie Taylor Greene has been joined by a second House Republican. Uh, Conservative Representative Thomas Massey from Kentucky has joined her in an effort to oust Mike Johnson after the announcement of this new package. Now, this is not the only thing that is leading to this. There's other stuff as well. They're unhappy with how the Mayorkas vote is doomed, and so they're taking it out on Mike Johnson, to put it bluntly. They're unhappy with a few things, but they still have yet to trigger it. Basically, Marjorie Taylor Greene a few weeks ago triggered or at least started the motion in order to uh, go public and say, hey, look, I have submitted paperwork to oust Mike Johnson, to call for a recall vote. And now considering the fact that he's an effective one vote majority, that's a problem. And now with the second person, that's even a bigger problem. But the Republicans also know that after the chaos of the last House speakership race, which had the most like repeat votes over and over and over again for like what? How long was it for like since the 1920s, 1930s? It was the most speakership votes in a row with them going through Thomas Massey, not Thomas Massey, Tom Emmer, then going through Steve Scalise, then going through Jim Jordan, going through Kevin McCarthy before eventually arriving at Mike Johnson. If they go through another round of votes, while also on record having the least productive congressional session since the Great Depression, which might become a record-breaking unproductive congressional session if the trends continue as they are, another House speakership race would look would make Republicans look like they don't have the ability to lead. They don't even have their own House in order, which they don't. And so Republicans are very, very, very against generally the idea of another recall vote. But Marjorie Taylor Greene, Thomas Massey, and other people of the Freedom Caucus ilk probably also don't want to lose their leverage. And so they've introduced the motion without triggering it because they know probably that it would not be productive for their election efforts going into 2024. Donald Trump is probably not a huge fan of another recall vote, considering Mike Johnson supported his unconstitutional effort to try to overturn the results of the 2020 election. And he was somebody that he gave the thumbs up for. And so they're probably in this limbo stance where they want to keep the leverage to pressure Mike Johnson, but they also can't pull the trigger because they know that it would be destructive not only for Mike Johnson, but for the whole party. And then all of the eyes were turned to them and they'd scream on the, at the top of their lungs, why did you do that? We're going into an election year. This is insane, which they would be in full right to do. So 
when I heard that Thomas Massey was signing on, I was waiting like, oh, God. Oh, God. Mike Johnson's going to go on TV. He's going to say, well, I said a Saturday vote. We were going to vote on this on Saturday, which is when they say they're going to vote on this. So we are just three days away from a vote on this, 72 hours. So people have more than enough time to read the legislation if they want to sit down and read the bill. In fact, if you want to read the Ukraine bill, it's not that hard. It's 25 pages. You could read this in like an hour, an hour to two hours. You could read this and you can understand what's in the bill. So it's not going to be a problem of, oh, process, and we didn't have enough time to uh, read. But they're challenging. They're challenging it. And so it's a question of whether Mike Johnson is going to back down and go on TV. And I said, maybe Saturday was a little too bold. Maybe how about summer? How about in deep summer we have a vote? Or how about we rework this again? You're never going to find anything that's going to please Marjorie Taylor Greene. She sympathizes with the invading force. There's a very good chance that she just straight up wants the Ukrainians to lose. When she is saying that the Russians are defending Christianity, there is no difference between her and a direct spokesperson for the Russian government. I question her motivations at this point. So this woman is never going to be satisfied. There will never be anything that is offered to her that will make her happy on this issue. So all you can do is bull past her and dare her to sink the party. And it seems like Johnson might actually do that. Mike Johnson moving forward with Ukraine aid bill despite pressure from hardliners. He doesn't want, he knows that if he doesn't push this forward, there's a good chance that the discharge petition, which already has a Republican vote on it from Ken Buck, by the way, who stepped out, could get more votes and then it could go around him and then they wouldn't pass any Republican legislation on this. They would be passing the Senate bill on this, which is, by the way, a bipartisan Republican Senate bill. So it'd still be Republican Democrat Senate bill from the Senate. It'd still be bipartisan. It just wouldn't be his alteration of the bill. So, but that would be humiliating and he doesn't want that. So he's probably come to the conclusion that Ukraine aid is getting through sooner or later and if it gets through later it will be going around him and humiliating him so he might as well just pass a version that is more favorable to his interests that includes some of trump's stuff like a loan which this does i believe seven eight point billion dollars of this bill is going to be refinanceable meaning that the ukrainians are going to eventually have to pay it back in a loan um and that uh, there's also some other provisions in it for example 45 days after the bill is signed, the Ukraine, uh, the American government has to produce a report about what America's goals are in the war in Ukraine. And and I think this is the best part of the bill. It is the only thing that makes it. It's the only thing that's better than the outside of the fact they have to vote on it separately. That's better than the legislation that was already on the floor. And it's that this bill obliges the U.S. government to hand over long-range attackums missiles to Ukraine as soon as possible. Now. Let me be clear, it does not specify that it has to be the 300 kilometer ones. So it could just be maybe more of the 165 M39 block ones that are older. But I mean, even the longer 300 uh, kilometer ones are not in production anymore. So they're both older. And it also gives an exemption for if that delivery would undermine the defense of the United States. So there's also a way for Biden to still wiggle out of it. But having that type of commitment in law and making Congress's position on this clear, which would be in support of sending the TACMs over, would be good for uh, Ukraine and would likely lead to TACMs being sent over. It was, there was already a rumor going around that TACMs was going to be sent when the new aid bill was passed, but this would make it a lot more direct. It would be a direct challenge to the government. The government would have to respond and say, are we sending TACMs or are we not sending TACMs? Uh, and if they did, that would probably also mean a meeting about these things not being used against Russian oil refineries, since the American government is not a big fan of a, a Ukraine's drone program. Uh, let's just say of its uh, anarcho-primitivist position on the Russian energy industry. So we've already talked about the bill a little bit. So let's go back into the bill and talk some of the details. Like I've already said, it's going to require them to send the long-range attackums. In total, the bill is $61 billion, which is about the same as the previous bill. 
of which $23.2 billion will be used to replenish defense goods and services provided to Ukraine, meaning that a big portion of this bill is not aid to Ukraine, to be clear. And this has always been true of even the Senate bill, but a large portion of it is refurbishing our stockpiles with new top of the line equipment from defense companies uh, and so about 50% of that is this. And I believe Mike Johnson even said 80% of it, but I think he was fudging the numbers a little bit because 80% of it isn't just replenishing our stockpiles and stuff that's going to go to us. Some of it, uh, a, a good portion of it is still aid to Ukraine. But point is, a strong portion of this is replenishing our own stockpiles, just like the previous legislation was. $11.3 billion for current U.S. military operations in the region. $13.8 billion for the purchase of the latest weapon systems, goods, and services for defense purposes. $26 million for continued oversight and accountability for assistance equipment provided to Ukraine. And $7.8 billion of direct financial assistance in credit, meaning that this $7.8 billion, I said $7.2, oh, sorry, it was $7.8, would need to be repel, repaid at a later date. It also requires, as I said before, that the State Department and the Pentagon provide a clear U.S. strategy for Ukraine within 45 days. Whether that plan would be public or private, we do not know. I would hope it would be public. And I'm hoping that this would kind of make the Biden administration either say, our goal is just to not have Ukraine collapse, or our goal is to help the Ukrainians win, or come as close to that as possible, and give them the most leverage for negotiations, whatever that may look like as possible. Whatever it look, whatever that game plan is going to be, there is a Ukrainian government victory game plan. There's already has been one. They've talked about it openly before. So the idea that there's no plan for victory is not true. But from the American government's perspective, they have not put out a clear plan or a path to victory. The Ukrainian government has. The American government hasn't. And if it does, I'm interested in seeing how the public's going to react to it. Because if they get in the trench and say, look, we're going to have to support Ukraine until there's a good point for negotiations where they can get most of their land back or all their land back or the best deal they could possibly get, uh, it would be better than living in a limbo of, OK, we just passed this aid package. Hopefully we'll pass another one in a year with no long term commitments. I'm sure they have some idea privately, but making that more public, I do think is positive. I don't think it's going to change much on the ground, but I do think it'll be positive. So this is basically the same bill. I'm going to be blunt with you. This is the same bill. The only differences here is, one, there's a requirement to send over the attackums, which still has asterisks attached to it, which allows the president to avoid it if he can claim a national security reason not to. Uh, and it makes the financial assistance to help keep the Ukrainian government afloat so it can pay pensions to teachers and stuff like that, which is really important if you want the government to function, uh, is a loan instead of a just direct financial aid package. Um, outside of that, everything else is the same. Oh, except for the Pentagon thing. But everything else is the same. When it comes to the, the total amount of money, this was not repackaged to make it a lot less. When it comes to the general goals of it, it's basically the same. This is the same package with slight alterations. This is the same alt package with slight alterations. It certainly was not six months of effort. And if you want to read it yourself to get all the juicy details, it's 25 pages long. At the Ukraine section, that is. You can go check that out yourself. Now, I just want to say for the 10 millionth time, this could have been done six months earlier. And then maybe cities like Chasov Yar, which have now been made frontline cities, would not be so much frontline cities. Maybe the Russians would be further back. Maybe I would be able to go back to Chasov Yar to help evacuate civilians some more. Who knows? And it's all shoulda, coulda, woulda. But when Chasov Yar looks like this and has been made a frontline city, when Ukrainian uh, energy production and uh, electricity infrastructure is getting targeted, civilian infrastructure is getting targeted, when there's a 10 to 1 shell disadvantage, when we're getting reports saying, hey, we're trying to get to 100,000 shells a month and we're on the path to it, but if we don't pass this soon, those investments are going to lag and it's only going to be 75,000, and that means furthering our distance between us 
and Russian shell production, which is not only bad for the Ukrainians, is bad for the United States too, as all of this development was, all these developments were happening, a one to 10 difference. We just sat on our hands, sat on our hands, sat on our hands, sat on our hands. And now that we're finally at the finish line, the legislation's basically the same, except a few alterations that could have been passed independently six months ago and could have been entered six months ago. It really just seems like they've waited until the buzzer, until the situation has gotten so bad that if they were to continue to delay it, eventually there would be a security crisis of a breakthrough. And Zelensky is starting to hint that, you know, they cannot continue to hold the Russians back without continued support, especially when it comes to air defense, since Ukrainians just simply do not produce enough air defense domestically to protect their airspaces properly. It seems like they really just waited to the buzzer. What's that old Churchill quote? The United States will try everything in the world before eventually finally doing the right thing. It does seem like we've kind of landed in that area. Also, I do want to put forward, and this might be partially due to the fact, uh, or at least when it comes to how the public or the re Republican base interacts with their uh, leadership, interacts with the Republican Party and pressures them one way or the other, it may be also an issue that the majority of Republicans believe that they can get good information about the war from Donald Trump. Listen to this. Look at this number. Num uh, number. Ukraine-Russia conflict. Who do you trust for information? State Department. This is amongst Republicans. 27%. Journalists in war zones, 33%. Sorry, guys. I'm just not that trustworthy. Conservative media, 56%. Oh, okay. So the people on the ground, don't, who cares? Who megalaws? People in Washington, D.C. with a teleprompter in front of them. Nah, man. Teleprompter, good. Teleprompter, good. Pentagon, 60%. And Donald Trump, 79%. You know, last Friday, Donald Trump said, no more aid to Ukraine until Europe pays for help. Europe pays more than we do. They just passed like a $50 billion package a few months ago. Now they're talking about a $100 package going into the future. The Germans have approved $8 billion for this year. The French, $3 billion. The Dutch, I think, 2 to $3 billion. The British, billions. Other people, billions of dollars. It could be more. It should be more. But we haven't passed the new Ukraine aid for six months. The Europeans have overtaken us. They've overtaken us in uh, commitments and in multi-year commitments, meaning that commitments into the future and commitments already made. I mean, it's just, he's just disconnected. He doesn't know. He's either not paying attention or he's lying. And 79% of people, trust a man who's never been to Ukraine, who knows barely, basically nothing about Ukraine, who doesn't know anything about the strategic situation and certainly isn't following the daily updates, he's the number one trusted source on the war in Ukraine. This issue within the Republican Party has to be addressed if it wants to be considered at all a serious player in the foreign policy conversation.